Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're kicking off a brand new Let's Talk lore series covering the life of Shi Xie. Now, despite being a relatively minor character during the history of the Three Kingdoms, Shi Xie was able to achieve something that no other warlords could boast, and that is he kept his land and people safe during his 40 years reign over Jiaozhi. Now, before we dive into his reign in the south, we need to provide a bit of background for him so that we can better understand his motivations and drive. And here we can see that Shi Xie, styled Wei Yan, was born in the year 137 and died in the year 226 at the age of 90, which is a long time, even in today's standard. And since I just mentioned that his rule over Jiaozhi lasted for over 40 years, this means he was 50 years old when he had first earned his title of the administrator of Jiaozhi. And through his true diplomatic dealings, he was able to eventually earn the title of General of the Left from Cao Cao's imperial court before shifting sides after the Battle of Chibi to eventually earn the title of General of the Guards and Marquis of Longbian from Sun Quan. And at the bottom here, we have an honorary title in Viennese, granted to him more than a thousand years after his death by the Chen Dynasty in Vietnam. And the reason why he would receive such an honorary title is because Jiaozhi is situated in modern-day Vietnam, and Shi Xie ruled over a populace that consisted heavily of culturally Viennese people, even though the term itself and the concept of Vietnam did not exist back in those days. And the Han Chinese refer to them as cultural subgroup of the Yue people. And even today, Vietnam is pronounced Yuenan in Chinese, with Yue referring to the Yue people and Nan meaning South. So at this point, you might be wondering if Shi Xie was Viennese. Well, the simple answer here is no. Shi Xie's clan hailed from the Lu region in the Central Plains, in a place called Wenyang. And around the year 23, the Shi clan decided to depart from their homeland as refugees, escaping the chaos from the waning years of Wang Mang's rebellion that divided the Western and Eastern Han dynasties. And as many refugees fleeing war in ancient China, they decided to flee south to the administrative capital of the faraway Jiao province in a city called Guangxin. Here, the Shi clan re-established themselves as a wealthy and influential clan from the Central Plains, and after six generations, Shi Xie would be born in the same city to a much wealthier and powerful clan. And in his teenage years, Shi Xie's father would rise to become the administrator of Runan, which is a commandery deep in the south of the Han Empire. And this provided Shi Xie the opportunity to receive a better education in the capital city of Luoyang, where he would end up spending most of his adult life studying and working under the scholar Liu Tao. And as you can probably guess from the name, Liu Tao is a relative to the imperial bloodline. But much like Liu Bei and Liu Biao, Liu Tao was a distant, distant relative to the emperor that requires tracing back his lineage for over 200 years to the Western Han Dynasty to even find the place where his branch of the family branched away from the emperor's line. But nevertheless, royalty is royalty, and Liu Tao was one of those rare ones that not only cared deeply about his country, but also was a renowned scholar in Confucius studies. And at the time when Shi Xie was entering Tai Xue, or the official government school in the capital, Liu Tao was a professor there. And it was here that Liu Tao would take young Shi Xie in under his wings as he became a teacher and a mentor to the boy from the Savage South. And even though we don't have any records of what Shi Xie learned, there are historical records of Liu Tao's teachings and recommendations that he wrote to the emperor. So from these, we can have a pretty good understanding of the thoughts and ideas that Shi Xie would be exposed to. And some of these key writings here relate to the relationship between the ruler and his people. In a letter to Emperor Liu Zhi, Liu Tao wrote that heaven and earth 
are required by the people to survive. Conversely, heaven and earth also requires people to reside in them to have a meaning. One cannot exist without the other, much like how the emperor and his people need one another. Right now, your majesty lives isolated, away from the troubles of his people. Your majesty's eyes cannot see the wars killing your citizens. Your ears cannot hear the cries of the soldiers. Natural disasters like flood and famine are unfelt within the palace. Even as the heaven warns you with earthquake and eclipses, your majesty is unbothered. Please remember how our ancestors took up arms against the tyranny of Qin and brought down an empire that was strong enough to unite the warring states. If the people's plight are continue to be ignored, surely that would be our fate as well. And this letter goes on much longer in the same tone, and I'm sure you can understand that such a letter will not be well received by the emperor. And even Liu Tao knew this as he ended his letter comparing himself to the frost being presented to the sun as he knows that such a letter will only result in doom for him. But luckily for him, being related to the emperor has its perks, as Liu Tao was spared from any repercussions. And overall, his time as a professor at Taishue, which was an institution that was set up to host debates about national policies, did yield some concrete results as Emperor Liu Zhi took his advice about not coining more money, as it was considered a solution to a current economic issue that was mainly caused by poor harvests. And Liu Tao was able to successfully argue his case that the poor harvest being the source of the issue would not be solved by printing more money, and that printing more money would actually only make things worse by artificially creating inflation. And luckily, Emperor Liu Zhi listened to him. So it's pretty clear that Shi Xie had a great teacher in Liu Tao. But sadly, Liu Tao's life didn't have a happy ending, as when Emperor Liu Zhi died, his successor, Emperor Liu Hong, was much less susceptible to Liu Tao's advice. And Liu Tao had some great advice at this time, as he advocated for the weakening of the powers of the eunuchs, he asked for the pardons for the scholars that were impacted by the party incident, and most importantly, Liu Tao warned the emperor about the rise of Zhang Jiao and suggested a crackdown over the yellow turbans while they were still in their infancy. But sadly, Liu Hong didn't take any of these advice to heart as he assigned Liu Tao to study the Confucius text called Zuo Zhuan, or Zuo Shi Chun Qiu, which is actually one of the books that is part of Lu Zhi's library in the game. Now, while we're not going to spend too much time talking about the materials covered in this famous historical text, we do need to know that Shi Xie, in his later years down south, will become an expert over this book, as he will write over 11 tomes of commentaries covering this text, and these commentaries were often cited by scholars in later periods of the Wei and Jin period, so from this, we can also see the impact of Liu Tao's teachings had on Shi Xie in his formative years. Now, what is even more tragic than being assigned to study over a book instead of helping out the country is that after the Yellow Turban Rebellion did happen, Liu Hong's first instinct was to apologize to Liu Tao for not listening to his advice and even offered him a promotion. But very soon, after the initial wave of the rebellion had been beaten back, many of the eunuchs at court started spreading rumors to the emperor that Liu Tao was able to accurately give his advice and prediction only because he had actually been in cohort with the yellow turbans since the beginning. And this prompted an investigation that resulted in the imprisonment and torture of Liu Tao, who in his last days put up a hunger strike in prison as a testament to his innocence before ultimately dying. And after his death, folk songs and poems were written by people to remember his deeds, and we actually have one of them here. And in Chinese, it's Yu Yu Bu Le, Si Wo Tao Jun, He Shi Zai Lai, An Si Xia Min. And this would translate loosely into depressed, a longing for our Tao. When will he return again? 
to put us lowly people at ease. And from these songs and poems, we can see that Liu Tao was well loved by the people and well remembered. And this perhaps is a lesson that Shi Xie took to heart as he was able to rule his land for over 40 years without one battle being fought over it. And this was during the most chaotic and violent period of Chinese history in the time we now know as the Three Kingdoms. So now as we have sidetracked pretty far into Liu Tao's life, we're gonna backwind a bit and go back to Shi Xie. As we have been talking a lot about his rule in the south, but at this time, Shi Xie was still a simple government clerk working in the capital who is already approaching 50 years old. But fortunately for him, a position had just opened up in his home province of Jiaozhou as the former Jiaozhi administrator had died to a local rebellion. And now the imperial court is looking for a replacement. And the only problem is no one was willing to go. But Shi Xie was technically not qualified as there were two factors working against him. First, Shi Xie's father was still the administrator of Renan, which complicate things a little bit at court, as the court would rather not have the same family, father and son duel, controlling two-sevenths of one province. And second, this was Shi Xie's home province, and the Han government had always tried to avoid allowing locals to become administrators as it could easily lead to rebellions that's organized by such administrators. But very soon, both of these issues disappeared, as first, Shi Xie's father would actually die of old age, and second, no one else wanted the job. So Shi Xie got his wish at age 50, as he was allowed to return south in the year 187 to become the next administrator of Jiaozhi, a position that he will hold for the next 40 years. Now, while the first few years of his rule went relatively well for him within his own commandery, there was a looming issue throughout the whole province, as the imperial court has promoted Zhu Fu, who was the administrator of Yuzhang at the time, to become the next prefect of the entire Jiao province. And Zhu Fu, in case you're wondering here, is the son of the general Zhu Jun, who had led the southern Han forces against the Yellow Turbans and was the commander of a young Sun Jian. But unlike his honorable father, Zhu Fu was much more in tune with the corrupt ways of the imperial court as he utilized his promotion to hike tax rates across the province in an attempt to enrich himself. And this led to widespread local rebellions throughout the seven commanderies that made up the Jiao province and the result of these rebellions was the death of Zhu Fu and three other administrators in the commanderies of Jiuzhen, Hefu, and Nanhai. So Shi Xie, being a good administrator where his commandery didn't rebel and also a great older brother, ended up writing recommendations to the imperial court recommending his three younger brothers in Shi Yi, Shi Wei, and Shi Wu to take over these three commanderies as their new administrators as he argued that their clan, being a long-time resident in the South, is exactly what the South need at this time to help soothe the relationship with an angry populace. And since the imperial court already had so much trouble filling Shi Xie's job, they happily agreed. So overnight, the Shi clan gained control of over half of the Jiao province. And to find out how they will rule over this land, Please come back next time as we'll wrap up our two-part special on Shi Xie with part two titled A Southern Paradise. So hope you guys enjoyed this episode and until next time, bye!